Joining us now, Lars Larson, nationally syndicated talk radio show host. Thanks for joining us, Lars. I'm glad to do it, Gerard. I didn't realize I was supposed to wear a jacket. I wore my favorite new shirt. It's uh, Truth, the New Hate Speech. So, <laughs> I love I, I it. I thought that would, fit, that would fit perfectly. But I heard you talking about uh, Ron Wyden and this new billionaire's tax. Uh, yeah. This is crazy. Uh, first of all, can I tell you something about Ron Wyden? Now, sure. the great state of Mississippi has two United States senators, and they both are from Mississippi and live in Mississippi, right? Cor correct. Okay. Yep. Ron Wyden does not live in the state he claims to represent. I don't know whether you know that detail or not. He lives more than 2,500 miles away in New York City. So you got to be kidding me. Is, is there no uh, requirement to have oh, residency? There's a requirement. There, there's a requirement, but Democrats and we don't need no stinking requirements. They don't need a border. <laughs> they, they, they don't need to have reasonable energy costs. They, they don't need any of that stuff. Ron Wyden is now. I want to tell you another detail. This is a guy who uh, grew up in Palo Alto, California. Went to high school, went to college, went to law school, and has never had a real job in his entire life. He has been in the Congress, including the House and then the Senate, uh, for 41 yeah. years. So he's almost as bad as the demented Delawarean, uh, Joe Biden, because <laughs> he's never had a real job. But somehow, without a real job, you know, look, we pay members of Congress reasonably well. I think they make about a buck seventy-five if you're in the Senate, right? Hundred seventy-five thousand. Right. Yep. Now that'll pay the bills, but if you've got to maintain two houses, one in D.C. and one on the West Coast, you got to buy a nice suit, you got to dress up decent, you got to get a decent haircut. One seventy-five goes real fast. I mean, because I people say, I know that. I, Average folks are going to say, no, no, that's a lot of money. I said, well, hold on, 175000 you're going to take home about ten or $12,000 a month after taxes. And now you're going to maintain two houses. you got to dress like a senator. Costs money. So he becomes a multi-multi-millionaire. He then marries, and this is the thing, he got his money the old-fashioned way. He married it. He married a woman <laughs> who, who is a, also a multi-multi-millionaire, and she got her money the old-fashioned way. She inherited a business from dad, and it's a bookstore in New York City called the Strand Bookstore. So she got her money the old-fashioned way by inheriting it. Ron Wyden, who knows how he got his money on a salary that pays the bills and is nice but is not going to make you rich. So he lives in New York City with his wife. He is not estranged from her. He, is, he, he has three small children, school-age children, and they live in New York City. But he represents Oregon. Now, can you figure that out? No. Uh, you, you just uh, uh, caused my level of contempt for the senator from Oregon to <laughs> increase somewhat after that analysis uh, there, Lars. I did not know those details. I, I know that uh, he is obsessed with, uh, I'm not even going to call it taxation, he's obsessed with confiscation, is, yes. is really what it is. Yes, that is exactly <laughs> what it is. Now, and you know what's, what's crazy? He's the chairman of the Senate Finance Committee, and I think he thinks he can slide this one by Americans, because he'll say, they, number one, uh, an old friend of mine who's passed away, but who's a great champion of anti-tax movements, you know, protecting taxpayers, Don McIntyre. And he used to say that you can get a lot of people, both conservatives and liberals, to agree with this. Don't tax me. Don't tax thee. Tax that guy over there behind the tree. Now, the, the, and what happens is if you say to, let's say, a teetotaler who does not drink, uh, we're going to tax alcohol. They say, yeah, yeah, tax that alcohol. And if you say it to a non-smoker, we're going to tax cigarettes. Yeah, tax cigarettes. Because <laughs> I think a, a, a good conservative would say, do not increase taxes even if I don't pay those taxes. But Correct. this guy has, he's figured out that if you tell people we're going to tax billionaires, uh, they say, well, I'm not a billionaire. Uh, I'm not even a millionaire. So I don't care. Go ahead and tax them. Can I remind you of something in tax history? 108 years ago, the Congress passed the very first 
income tax. Now, there was a little income tax back in the 1860s that paid for the Civil War, but it lasted for about 11 years and it went away. The actual income tax we paid today was packed, passed in uh, 1913. And here's right. how it worked. They said to Americans who made somewhere between, depending on what you did and where you lived, the average was 200 to $400 a year. And they said, hey, we're going to tax the people who make over $3,000 a year. Now, the average American at that time could not have conceived of being able to make $3,000 a year. Uh, sure. that, that turned out to be wrong. But, you know, they said, go ahead. And they said, by the way, the tax is only going to be 1%. And only if you make $500,000 a year <laughs> will you pay even the top rate of 6%. Now, I know there's a lot of numbers and radio numbers don't work well, but imagine yeah. this. You're sitting there and you're working an average job, 1913, and they say, hey, we're going to tax people. And if you make $500,000 a year, you will have to pay a tax of 6%. This is a guy or gal, most of them guys at that time, who has said, I can't even imagine making $500, let alone $500,000. Go ahead, tax sure. the daylights out of those guys, the Vanderbilts and the Carnegies and the rest of that bunch. So they pass a tax. Today, the average American pays 14% of his entire paycheck. Uh, as the average once you're done with all the deductions and all that and the top end rate is almost 40 percent so Wyden comes along and says we got to get after these unrealized gains now that's where you use IRS language and it's designed to confuse people I know there are people listening to your show who have bought a house and if they bought a house a decade ago and it's gone up in value say it's gone up in 10 years maybe it's gone up a hundred thousand dollars you say to your wife, hey, sweetie, we've got $100,000 in equity. Someday, that might actually fund our retirement. Or maybe you've got 50000 in equity. Or maybe you got smart and bought some stocks of one kind or another, and uh, or your mom and dad left you some stocks, and they've gone up in value. That is The up in value part, the increase, is called unrealized gains. And the reason the IRS calls it unrealized is because you don't have it. It's only on paper. <laughs> And what the IRS says is the minute you sell it, uh, you have to pay taxes on that because then you have realized the gain. Senator right. Wyden says we should be able to tax unrealized gains, the money you haven't made yet. No profit. It's taxing no profit. not existing so profits. You, That's the way I just described it. <laughs> well, it is because think about this. Back, back in 2008, most of America saw the value of their houses drop by 30% or more. So if you lived in a real nice house in Mississippi that was worth 300 grand, and all of a sudden after the 08 collapse in September, it went from 300,000 to 200,000 just like that. And you say, yeah. now what if I'd been paying the IRS taxes on my, my unrealized gain of $300,000, and then the value of my asset drops? I think the IRS says it sucks to be you. Yeah. We're not giving you any money back. We only tax on the upside. We don't. We don't do anything for you on the downside. <laughs> so now the the latest I caught last night, Lars, is that they want to levy this tax on unrealized gains of uh, liquidatable assets, and for more static, not as liquid assets such as real estate. Wyden wants right. interest to be charged. He wants an interest rate to just be levied. It's like a national property tax, essentially, is what he wants to sure do year after year. Except except on prop. And I've had people say, well, Lars, what about property tax? And I say, property taxes pay for the services you get, for the most part, from your county. So you pay for taxes. The property. And the yeah, yeah. Well, because think about this. How much is your property worth if you don't have a sheriff's department? And you say, well, well, it'd still be worth the same. And I said, no, it wouldn't. If I lived yeah. in a county with no sheriff's department, when somebody shows up and camps on my land and I say, you got to get off my land, he's going to say, who says? I said, well, I'm going to call the sheriff. Oh, I forgot. We don't have one because we didn't like property taxes. <laughs> oh, and by the way, if I've got a boundary dispute with my neighbor and I say, hey, neighbor, you can't build your barn on my property. And, I, and he says, what are you going to do? I said, well, I'm going to go to court. Oh, sorry. We don't have courts. Those are paid for with property taxes. <laughs> and and if, you're, if your friends say, what are, what are your kids going to do when they grow up? And he goes, well, when they finish school, oh, I forgot. We pay for school with property taxes. There are no schools in my county. My kids are going to grow up only knowing what I can teach them, which may not be much. 
Lars, we're up against a break. Have you got uh, time to hang around through the break? I've always got time for you, Drug. <laughs> Appreciate it, Lars. We'll be right back. Lars Larson, a nationally syndicated talk radio show host, is our guest. Stay with us. Middays, we'll be right back. Super Talk Studios, Lars Larson is our guest. So, Lars, I don't know if you caught this article by one of my favorite writers, Liz Peek. And uh, Liz wrote uh, a great piece that was published a few days ago where she basically says Biden and the Biden administration are tone deaf to the issues <laughs> that Americans care about. And, you know, politicians, we talked about this yesterday, they love to use this, you know, the issues that American families are discussing at the kitchen table. I don't think they're talking about climate change and pronouns. That's what the administration nope. seems to be focused on. They are. And think about this. Americans, I mean, even Bill Clinton, even the horny hick from Arkansas, understood <laughs> the issues. It is the economy, stupid. Now, what happens when you say, we're going to build back better, but it's going to come at a higher price? Your inflation is going to wipe out any wage gains you had. Every time you pull up to the pump, you are going to get slapped with a lot of extra money. Do you know, Gerard, there are parts of this country where gasoline is now approaching $8 a gallon. $8 a gallon. Then the average, the average driver is seeing an average of $30 to $40 extra every single fill-up. So if you're a working man or woman and you have to fill your tank once a week, that's only an extra 120 to 160 bucks a month. So before you even go to the grocery store, they've already peeled that much out of your post-tax paycheck. How is that going to hit average families? Joe Biden has no appreciation for that. In fact, a week, less than a week ago, his friends at the Chicken Noodle News Network, CNN, they held a town hall, which is basically a giant Joe Biden PSA saying maybe we can rehabilitate this joker's reputation because he is sinking fast. So they put him on and Anderson Cooper, who totally you know tries to do him all the fair, throws him all the softballs, just like Don yeah. Lemon. And he asks him, well, Mr. President, what are you going to do about the high price of gas? And he, he starts out by just, he was honest. He said, I actually don't have any good ideas for bringing down the price of gas. But then he doubles down on that. And he says, it's all going to depend. I, I kid you not. It's all going to depend on what Saudi Arabia does. And I thought, hold on a second. This is the second coming of the worst president of the last century, James Earl Carter, peanut farmer from Georgia, who allowed Americans to be held hostage to the desires of OPEC and, and to be dependent. At, at one point, we imported 57% of our oil. And God bless him, Donald Trump made sure that by the time Joe Biden on January 20th took the oath of office, we were energy independent. We produced more oil than the country consumes and we had enough for export, which is a good thing. And because yeah. it it's always a good thing when you raise more or grow more or, or have more of the stuff you need so you can sell it and make some cash. And so so we have now gone from energy independent to the president of the United States on national television saying we're hostage to the Saudis. Your gas prices <laughs> are high till some Saudi prince says we can bring them down and they're not going to do it. I, I caught uh, the Cooper Town Hall. I believe it was in Baltimore. And, uh, and and nobody watched it. Uh, Lars, maybe you did and I did. I'm not sure anybody else watched the thing, honestly. Do, do you know what the numbers were that night? I know they were terrible. What? There there are 330 million people in this country. Yeah. 10% uh, would be 30 million. 1% would be 3 million. Joe didn't make one half of 1%. They clocked in with 1.16 million Americans, which means... It was the entire political class in Washington, D.C., and everybody involved in partisan politics in the 50 <laughs> states, and people like you and me. That's a million people right there. <laughs> that, that's like less than a, than a, a, a major local market. And, Tucker and Carlson, I country. think, tripled Joe's number that night. <laughs> Uh, yeah, I watched it, and I saw that, and, and what uh, Rhino and I caught was Joe when he stood like Beavis. <laughs> he had the hands <laughs> extended with the thumbs rolled. What was that all about? 
Can, can I be, be a bit indelicate? Because I will tell you what <laughs> flashed through my mind when I saw Joe Biden sat, looking like he was holding the walker in the old folks home, you know, and trying to get <laughs> to lunch. But, but what flashed through my mind, and I think this, now hold on, Gerard, this is a working theory I've got for you. About 40, 30 years ago, I got the great pleasure of being able to fly in the back seat of a Blue Angels fighter jet. Now you say, well, they don't have back seats. Yes, they do. They, they, have, they have training models, right? That's but it's right. one of the Blue Angels jet. One of them has, you know, I think it's only one of them has a, a rear seat and you can put a guest back there. And so <laughs> they said, uh, I was a reporter and they said, would you like to take a flight? And I said, I have never turned down an airplane flight in my life. And I've been on some great airplanes, but never one as good as an F-A-18 Hornet. Now, yeah. what you have to know is, the Blue Angels wear those trim blue jumpsuits. I mean, they look like they came out of central casting, and God bless them. They've got the skill and talent. They deserve to look like that. Now, if yes. you wear a, a, a G suit, which looks like you're wearing poopy pants, uh, you are wearing <laughs> these big, saggy things. And what happens is, in, in, a, in a regular fighter jet, they put these this G suit on you, it's, and it's got air uh, lines through it. And when you start pulling G's, the airplane pumps air in there. And what it does is squeezes your legs to keep the blood up on your gray matter, you know, where it's right. not with Joe. And and it squeezes the blood up there. So they said, I said, well, what's going to happen? I, I said, I want to take some G's. They said, Are you sure? I said, yeah, let's go do some high G maneuvers. And we got up to 6.4. And and I was having a fun Ooh. time. But here they said, hey, here's how you do it. On either side of the cockpit, not where the, the, the flight controls are, but up near the cockpit window, there's a short stick, you know, metal uh, pipe sticking up on, on both sides. And they even put little bicycle grips on them, like you, put, uh, you used to put on your, ten, on your uh, bicycle. And they say, here's what you do. They said, when we're going to go into a high G maneuver, because you're not flying the plane, obviously. I'm sitting in the back seat. They said, you grab a hold of that thing. And then they said, Imagine that you've been constipated for a week and you are having a tough time. Grab those handles and bear down hard because what it will do is it will your abdominal muscles and everything else will push the blood back up to your head. And, and you know what? It works. My theory is that Joe Biden was squeezing his hands, hoping he could keep enough blood flowing to his brain so he could answer the next question. He was trying to avoid it's just hypoxia. A <laughs> exactly. uh, it's scary, though, Lars. I mean, it's scary. I, and, and you and I can have fun with it, as we should. But oh, at yeah. the end of the day, it's it's disturbing that this is a guy that's in it charge. Is quite it's frightening. And, and that he's making the judgment calls on all kinds of things, which may explain why things have gone so badly wrong. I mean, even even Obama would course correct when he saw that something was going wrong. And even uh, the aforementioned horny hick, uh, Bill Clinton, <laughs> course corrected. You know, he came in with big spending plans. And in 92, when he re in 94, when he realized I've lost the midterms, I'm getting clocked here. I got to do some course correction. And he did that. And he signed yeah. off on, you know, welfare reform and a number of other good things for the country. Because when things are, you know, when you're in a hole, the first thing you do is stop digging. And then you yeah. got to figure out how you're going to fix things. Joe Biden does not have the working gray matter to make those course corrections. Uh, it's, it's It truly is scary. And uh, we were just talking earlier, Lars, about uh, some high-level person from the CIA is scheduled to be on the Hill today, not testifying about China's hypersonic ambitions, but about diversity and inclusion in the CIA. Do you realize what a joke this whole thing is? Because this is bringing back a form of segregation. Because sad to say, there was a time in American history where a black man or a black woman could not get a seat at a diner, right. could not get a seat on the bus, and could not get a job and couldn't get into schools. And it was wrong to say, we are going to discriminate on the basis of race or gender or anything else. And we've passed a ton of laws at the federal level, the state level, and everything else to say, you can't do that. And now we've got DEI, as they call it, diversity, equity, and equity. inclusion. And they said, you will start to, d to discriminate on that basis. You will hire people who are not the most talented applicant, but you will hire them because 
they have the right skin color or the right gender or the right sexuality or whatever and it is it's going to be disastrous because frankly if if you got hired because of your skin color uh that's bad enough but imagine the person because there are a lot of them qualified black men and women qualified hispanic men and women qualified native americans who say i earned this job through my skill and yet the the existence of dei will have everybody saying no no he didn't get that for his skill he got that because he was the right color it's it's uh pervading uh and permeating every corner of the country it's very disturbing lars always a pleasure having you on sir thanks so much for joining us today thank you for having me on my show sir it's a pleasure (laughs) <laughs> we'll talk to you later. Thanks. Lars Larson, nationally syndicated talk radio show host, has been our guest. Stay with us. Middays will be.